Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Kevin Moran. Kevin is the COO of Ulti Global, a publicly traded multifamily office and alternatives firm with over $72 billion in assets. Kevin shares his insights on how Ulti Global has grown over time, creating a service offering ecosystem to meet the growing and evolving needs of its ultra high net worth clients. He shares his thoughts on M&A as a function of organic growth, unique investment strategies, and strategic succession planning. We also cover the sales process for the ultra high net worth space and how to apply client service on a global basis with a local touch. Please enjoy my conversation with Kevin Moran. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk about all things alternatives and the ultra high net worth channel. I'd love for you to just maybe tell us a little bit about your background and your career to Alti. Sure. Well, I'm excited to be with you and I look forward to talking to you today. I've been with Alti Tiedemann Global for the last 16 years. So I came to the firm as an attorney. So I went to law school, practiced as an attorney for a few years, both privately, and then got exposure to the alternative space. First through my law firm practice, where most of our clients were hedge funds, private equity, broker dealers. But from there, I took a job at a fund of funds business that was actually good training in many ways for this job now because it was a global firm. I worked out of the New York office, but for a UK-based business, and most of the investors were from Asia and from Europe. It was good exposure to operating within a global alternatives business. When I joined Tiedem in 2008, we were a US-focused ultra-high net worth business. It's gone from being a US-focused high net worth business to being a global multifamily office. So my role has changed a lot over the last 16 years or evolved, I should say. But I came originally to handle legal compliance, gradually got involved in more and more of an operational role, got exposure to finance really across all aspects of the firm. And then today, I am the chief operating officer and the president of the public company, which is Alti Tiedemann Global. That's correct. Maybe give us an overview of what Alti or Alti Tiedemann Global is, just for a background. We are a NASDAQ-listed public company. We've been public now for, I think it's almost 20 months, so we're pretty early in our public journey. But what we are is a global multifamily office. Really, we're an investment advisor, but we're much more than that. So in terms of what a multifamily office provides, you think of it, all of us, we have homes and families and bills and budgets and investments and looking to save money for retirement. That's really what we do as a firm in a much larger fashion than what an individual family is doing. But we're looking to provide a broad and deep set of services to the families, individuals, and the institutions that we work with. So certainly investments is a key part of that. If you're a wealthy family and you're looking to have a family office or looking for an advisor, typically we'd have multiple advisors working with you, just like many of us do. I think of it, you have an attorney, certainly if you're in the US, taxes are a big part of what our expenses are, so to speak, every year. So you have an accountant, you might have an investment advisor, investment managers, right? You're working with a number of people. And what we look to do is to try to provide as many of those services within our firm as we can to our clients. We don't do everything. So there's certain areas where we coordinate or bring in outside advisors. So it's not necessarily a one-stop shop in terms of us providing every service that a family could theoretically need. What we want to be is the one phone call. So the family calls us, and if we don't do it ourselves, we'll find the service offering for the family. So in terms of a multifamily office, it's really the investment side. But we have a what we call family office services. So cash flow forecasting, budgeting, some cases, paying bills, sort of the financial side of a family or an individual's life. In addition to the investments, we have a trust team and a trust company. 
So that's the important part in terms of succession planning and estate planning and tax structuring. It's an important part of what we do. We have a terrific impact investing capability. What is impact investing? For us, it's a way to provide families a means to investing their portfolio and achieving values and purpose-driven objective to their allocation and investment of their wealth. Give us a snapshot on the number of people you have, assets, offices. What's that footprint look like? So we have a little over 400 people globally. That headcount is about evenly split between our U.S. and our international business. We truly are a global firm. In terms of offices, we have 22 offices globally. We have 12 of those in the United States, so about 10 outside of the United States. Within the U.S., we're truly a national firm. We have offices up and down the East and West Coast, as well as three offices in the Midwest, being Dallas, Texas, Aspen, and Minneapolis. And then internationally, we're across Europe. We have offices in the U.K., France, Switzerland, Portugal, through Lisbon, as well as offices in Hong Kong and Asia. We're not a bank. What we view as an independent multifamily office operating globally, and we're we're also unique in that we're publicly listed, which is pretty rare in this space. When did you guys go public? We went public January 3rd of 2023. The process to go public started really in 2021. We went public through a SPAC, so it wasn't a traditional IPO, but our first day of public trading was January 3rd of last year. Wow. How has that changed you in your role as a COO dealing with being private and then going public? CEOs generally across industries have similar focuses. Certainly, I view the job as making sure to the extent possible that the business operates as well as it can be on a day-to-day -day basis. The primary focus for me, at least, as a CEO is to make sure that the business can operate as efficiently and as well as possible. We, that allow us to provide the best services possible to our clients and to our investors, making sure that our employees have the resourcing and the tools they need to be successful. So. In some ways, being a COO, is, you, you see an issue, coming up with a solution. How do you improve something? How do you fix something in case something is broken? How do you continue to work with your colleagues to try to improve things? Nothing is ever as ideal as you would like it to be. At least my viewpoint is we could always do something new. Technology is constantly evolving. How do we apply technology to the firm to improve how we're doing things? How do we take a fresh look at a workflow? There's maybe a better way of doing it as we've grown you bring in new employees who come from other either competitors, other firms, the financial services space, and we're always open to, is there a better way of doing something? And a great way of learning whether there is or isn't is when you add new employees to the firm who have their own perspective and experience and have worked in a business that is maybe adjacent to what we're doing, but a lot of the underlying principles and workflows are fairly, I think, consistent across a lot of what we do in financial services. So the COO role, the core Focus hasn't changed, certainly the scope, uh, the types of problems you deal with changes as the business grows and evolves. But at its core, the job is to make sure that the business can operate as well as it possibly can. Tell me about the evolution. I would guess that a lot of the growth you've had has been through acquisition with a global footprint like that. When I joined the firm in 2008, the firm had started a few years before me. So we started in 2000 in the United States. So we're now to our 25th year operating. We really had the same focus for the 25 years is trying to provide the best possible service to the families, individuals, institutions that we work with. But in terms of how we've grown, so really historically in the U.S., we grew actually organically, bringing on individual families and clients every year. So we have a team of people who try to do that. And we've been fortunate that we have a great reputation, really great service offering, really good people to have been able to grow the business organically. Now, we have done M&A as well. M&A is definitely a core part of the strategy going forward. But for us, how we view M&A, we look to partner with people who really believe in what we're doing and believe that if they join us and partner with us, they can provide a better offering to the clients that they work with. So we really focus first on how do you partner with people to the extent, you know, extent we can make sure that those people really believe and understand what we do. What we want to do is have we and the folks joining us are super excited about the ability to grow organically on a go-forward basis. So M&A for us is a means to accomplishing organic growth. It's not a means in and of itself. M&A also presents us an opportunity to add 
additional services and talented people to the firm. We got into impact investing in a more institutionalized and sizable fashion through an acquisition that we made in Seattle about six years ago. So m and is also for us a means to providing our clients with a better, deeper offering. So whether you're adding a capability, certainly adding talented people, it provides an ability for us to do succession planning as advisors age, which across the industry that's happening, these are people businesses, many of whom were started 15, 20, 25 years ago. So for us, m and is an opportunity to again, bring in younger, talented advisors into the firm to provide clients with the comfort that our service offering will certainly be able to outlast the current advisor or the team that's working with them. One question I have is, what is a typical sales cycle with bringing a, a large, ultra high net worth family from wherever they are over to Alti? It's family specific, so it's hard to make generalized statements about it because when we're introduced to a family, Certainly what could happen is if you have a family who has asked their accountant, a friend of theirs who may be a client of ours, an attorney, they might've had a privately owned business for a long time and have now just sold it or about to sell it. They don't have somebody like Alti that they're working with right now. So that what I would say is a faster sales cycle because there's a catalyst, family and individual is about to sell a business or maybe has actually just recently sold a business, has more liquidity than they've ever had in their lives and now realize that they need help to manage if they need this multifamily office capability. There's a separate pool of prospective clients. There may be people who are working with somebody already, and there may be turnover on their team, or for whatever reason, family, an individual wants to consider other options. So that may not have the same time urgency there. So it could be a longer sales cycle. So again, it very much, I think, depends upon why somebody is looking for somebody like us. The sales cycle can be as short as a few months. In some cases, these are relationships that are built over years. It could be a childhood friend that somebody has worked with or known here for 40, 50 years, and they get to a point in their life that they need some assistance in managing their financial affairs. And I guess in the third pool would be a family where one of the family members, the dad or the mom, has really managed their financial affairs and has done that themselves. Now getting to a point in their life where they realize that that isn't going to be something that can sustain indefinitely. They need to engage somebody like ourselves to come in and at least be able to work on a transition from self-managed to third-party managed. And how much is education with that wealth transfer? You have a lot of talk about the boomers of the world are going to now transfer this massive amount of capital to the next generation. And what does that education process look like with that type of handoff? So education is a core part of what we do. A lot of our families and the individuals we work with have had an enormous amount of success in a prior career or in operating a business, in many cases, though, outside of the financial services space. So think about all of the different industries in the United States and elsewhere. But either they themselves or in many cases, their children may have little familiarity with the financial markets. For example, taxes are obviously an enormous part of what we do in helping clients understand the tax picture thinking through how the tax structure will apply to different assets that they have. What do they want to accomplish? Helping facilitate a conversation. What is a family looking to achieve? They have a large pool of capital, maybe in some cases more capital than they would really ever need for their personal family's expenses. What do they want to achieve? What do they want to do with that capital? What, is the, what are the values and the purpose that they as a family are passionate about and looking for help with? Could be you may have younger family members who really don't have much knowledge that their parents have a lot of wealth. So working with a family in terms of how do you talk to your children or grandchildren about wealth and then what they want to be doing with the wealth. So education is a key part of what we do. It's very customizable to the personal individual or the family dynamic. So whether it's basic information around stocks, bonds, alternatives, what do those asset classes mean to maybe higher level conversations around tax and estate planning, to impact investing and values and purpose-driven approaches to investing your capital, education in all aspects. That is really important to what we do. We were talking earlier, you talked about this concept of being a general contractor. I want to talk a little bit more about that. It's really simplify what we seek to do is to provide families with time. And how do we do that? Well, if you look at broad scope of services, we provide the ability to talk about this general contractor theme. 
you may have had less exposure to multifamily office, but you only had exposure to a general contractor in all likelihood. Or maybe think about as your general practitioner for a doctor, your family physician, he or she isn't an expert in all fields. That's the first phone call you're going to make if you have a medical issue. We want to be the one call that a family or an individual has to make, and then we'll sort out everything else on the backside. So that's why using the general contractor analogy, if you're building a home, primarily you're going to work with the general contractor. The general contractor brings in the specialists, the plumbers, the carpenters. That's probably a pretty simplified version of what we do here at Alti Tiedemann. We have an enormous amount of capabilities in-house, but we don't have every capability. We have trust and estates attorneys, as an example. We work with families, tax advisors. But what we'll do is try to make that process as simple and as streamlined as possible for the family. We'll try to deliver that family for simplicity and time. So we'll coordinate with your tax advisors. We'll provide them to the extent possible all the information that your tax advisor needs to advise the family and to file your tax returns. We'll work with a outside trust and estate attorney on your estate plan. We don't do the drafting ourselves, but we understand what the family's looking for. We can communicate and make sure that the attorney is able to deliver the estate plan in a way to satisfy what the family is looking for. The idea being is that one call, and then the families can rely and trust that we'll, whether we're doing it internally or bringing in the right people externally, we'll deliver the right product and service for the client. How are you actually finding the service providers that are outside where you create partnerships? How do you keep track of who's trending up and who's trending down just so you guys can provide the best services for your clients? When a family engages with us as a firm, they're really engaging with all 400 plus people because it's very much I mean, one of the hallmarks of our culture and how we've grown the business and how we will continue to grow the business going forward is really it's one firm, it's one team. Now, if you're an advisor working with a client in California and a client has a question, that advisor may not have dealt with that themselves personally. It may be a client's looking to acquire an aircraft or looking for assisted living facilities for their parents. The benefits that we offer to that advisor, that advisor has the resources of the other 300 to 400 plus people here at the firm. So if you think across our business with 400 plus people and 800 or so clients, all likelihood, a colleague has dealt with a similar issue here just because of the network effect of who we work with. That collaboration and the ability to tap resources globally, I think is pretty unique. And we spend a lot of time making sure that that's the culture that's very team oriented. Everyone has a vested interest, regardless of what office you work in, and making sure that our clients have a terrific experience with us. So that's certainly a key part of it. And then if you think about our relationships that we work with, it's fast between asset management businesses that we work with globally, between accountants, between attorneys, all of the different providers that each of those families work with. Again, it vastly levers the network effect of us. To carry forward the tech discussion, how are you guys thinking about the buy-build offering for you? The technology field and the applications that are available to us dramatically changed, certainly while I've been here over my 16 plus years. Years ago, we had made the decision that we were a much smaller business at the time, but it's still a view that I think holds just as true today. We have a core expertise in lots of areas. Building technology is not one. So there are firms that have infinitely greater resources that we do and expertise and capabilities to do terrific softwares. We do spend a lot of time customizing a third-party software to our business. We do have a technology team that focuses on really being able to customize software to best suit the needs of our employees and our clients, but we don't design or build the software ourselves. We'd be able to provide our clients a much better offering if we were able to leverage and utilize the best, try to spend our time trying to figure out what is the best technology available to us as opposed to trying to build our own Technology, as we've all seen, if you build something, it can quickly become obsolete unless you continue to stay and invest on top of it. We are a buyer, not a builder of technology platforms. I'd love to turn to your approach to alternatives and give a backdrop, but there's a number of ways you can do it. I'd love to hear how you guys tackle alternatives for your clients. Alternatives, I think their use and popularity within investment accounts has changed a lot over the last 20 years. I think the investment industry as a whole has changed a lot over the last 20 years and what clients are looking for and expecting. 
from a firm like us to provide. So alternatives has always been a key part of the offering. It's a key part of a client's portfolio today. We think it adds a number of benefits to a client's portfolio, certainly diversification. From a risk return perspective, we think that you can generate alpha, essentially you know, returns in excess of a particular benchmark by investing into alternatives. Obviously, you have to spend a lot of time vetting and making sure that you're finding the best these alternatives or people-led businesses. We spend a lot of time trying to find the best people in the alternative space to allocate money to. But alternatives, a big portion of our client portfolios, both in and outside of the United States. In terms of how we access them, we have clients who can invest directly, but we also try to provide clients the simplicity and you know, simplicity in how we invest as well. So we use we call access funds, but really it's a we pull together clients to invest in a, in a particular asset class, private equity. We don't charge any fee for that. It's not a product for us. It's really a means to allow clients to get a diversified exposure to an asset class in a way that they really couldn't do if they were investing in individual managers. We try to minimize and make things simpler by having fewer K-1s for our clients. There's a lot of advantages that we seek to provide, not only how we access alternatives, but then alternatives of an asset class we think is really important to an overall clients. What are your thoughts on the expansion of alternatives heading downstream moving from ultra high net worth to the wealth channel? It's probably the natural evolution, whether you're looking at the technology or in this case, investments, I think we'll start at the higher end of the market and eventually it becomes more widely available. So I think that's been the case with technology and that's the case with investments as well. One thing the financial services industry does really well is looking at how to capitalize and make things as efficient as possible. As alternatives become more popular, people become more familiar with them, more interested in them, and then there's sort of a natural appetite for people who aren't ultra high net worth investors to access things like private equity, private credit, private infrastructure, venture capital. So aspects of the, I guess the investment universe that historically had been not widely available, had been more of an institutional ultra high net worth investor base. So democratizing alternatives. I think we as a firm believe in the alternatives as a space. They do have different sets of risks. If somebody's talking to you about investing into an alternative, you really need to understand what it is because it may be very different than what you expect or very different than investment you made in the past. It goes back to, are you understanding what you're investing into? Do you understand the risks as well as the returns? People intuitively understand this, but applying it, sometimes you can get enamored with what the returns could be, and you spend less time thinking about what the losses could be on the other side, but it doesn't work out as well. And then what about the operational friction? There's technology in the market today. It's much better than it has been. But for somebody who's experiencing that on the front lines with the ultra high net worth sector, if you were to take that and provide that to a broader set of people in larger numbers, I'm curious what your sense is of where we are today with regard to that operational friction of looking at an opportunity, subscription, investing, and cash flow. The frictional costs of investing into the public markets, they have dramatically improved over the last 20 plus years. One of the things we do in terms of how we structure this is there's a lot of logistics around investing into alternatives, particularly at scale. You're essentially most alternatives or a lot of alternatives are structured as partnerships. You have a partnership agreement, there's a legal agreement, there's legal terms. You need to understand what those documents say. So the wording in those documents can have a dramatic impact on your investment. There's a lot of intention and I think resourcing being spent. And I think those logistics will improve and the frictional costs will decline as we go forward. There's a lot of time and money and attention being spent in terms of if you want to make access to alternatives more broadly available. In order to do that, you're going to have to decrease the frictional costs to allocate. So there's costs and benefits to anything. It's only costs and benefits to alternatives. From an investment perspective, it certainly can enhance your returns, but there's correlating costs to doing that. Which people need to understand, then is the cost benefit worthwhile for the particular investor? It may not be. I want to now chat a little bit about just the industry and where things are going. There's a fair amount of consolidation going on in the market. And I'd love your thoughts on just industry trends and what you're seeing out in the market today. 
Certainly in the United States, but also outside, there's a lot of interest in the investment management space. Over the years, I think there's been a lot of consolidation in that industry. There's fewer big players now, and we're seeing consolidation in not only financial services, like you're seeing that in, in many areas where there's lots of smaller businesses, and then somebody sees the opportunity to pull together and pull some smaller businesses into a bigger business, and you can achieve synergies or cost benefits by doing so you can grow faster you can pool your resources together to decrease your operating costs we're seeing that in many industries and we're certainly seeing that in the wealth space the us investment advisory sector there's thousands of investment advisors in the united states each one of these is a business that could be a small business to some of these are massive businesses the business is dependent upon people many of these businesses were started years ago like all of us, every year we get a little bit older. So these businesses have advisors who may have started a business in their 30s and now they're in their late 60s or maybe even their 70s. So they're thinking, what do we do with this business? I have a ton of value. I have a terrific business. I've done a terrific job for my clients. I don't necessarily have a team of people who work with me who can take that business over for me when I retire. And then the clients are looking at it and say, well, the advisor may have worked with mom and dad 30 years ago, but now the advisor's working with our children, maybe even our, our grandchildren. What's going to happen to their accounts and the service offering if the advisor retires? So there's a lot of tailwinds behind the consolidation space. You have this demographic issue. You have certainly a broad recognition within the private investment space that wealth management businesses are terrific businesses. You get the benefits of market performance. You also get the benefits of GDP growth. As our economy grows, there's more wealth being created. And that's the case globally. If you look at what's happening in Asia and Europe and even in places like India over the next 10 to 15 years, South America, Africa, there is and will continue to be an enormous amount of wealth created outside of the United States as well. There's a need for the service. There's a need for wealth management businesses. We think that's going to be increasingly important to be able to provide in service families across country lines, because as families grow and as family members move and take jobs and get married, it's becoming you know, increasingly a global community. Being global is expensive and it's hard to do. Another tailwind behind consolidation, be able to build a global business through recruitment and in certain cases, M&A allows you to provide a much more scaled, I think, institutionalized service offering to your clients. And then with regard to your own activity, what makes an attractive partner for Alti Tiedemann? We spend a lot of time thinking on culture. How do we improve it? What are the values? Just like we talk to our clients about values and purpose, that's that's something that we spend a lot of time as a firm. Like, What do we as a firm value? What values do we want to perpetuate? What do we want to invest into? Certain cases, there may be things that we need to improve. So that's the kind of the mindset, whether we're adding a particular person and you know, we have an open role and we're looking to hire, or we're looking to recruit some advisors into the firm or potentially acquire a business, which typically would have more people. That cultural fit is absolutely key because if, if we screw up the people side, you can really screw up the business and screw up the client service offering. So when we interview a particular person, for a small firm like us, you can have 15 different people meeting the new hire because we want the new hire to really understand the firm and get a sense of their colleagues who they'll be working really closely with. And we want our current colleagues to make sure that they're comfortable with the, you know, the person or the team that we're bringing in, that we're all aligned. We all, just, we all have a client first mentality. We're all invested in trying to not only grow the business, but really in this team-oriented approach to working with each other. So cultural fit is really important to us in how we build the business. How do you do that with a global footprint? Client touch at an organization within Switzerland is going to be very different than an organization in the Hong Kong or the US. Is there some gold standard that you guys are trying to achieve with regard to that, or is it really specific to the region? It's a combination of the two. We've coined the term globalization. We have, we think, really terrific and immense global capabilities. We have a global investment team. We have a global advisory team. A lot of what we do at a global level that we think makes us a special place and a special service offering for our clients. But the localization of that globalization term 
the, the trick is how do you apply these global capabilities and customize it for a particular family in a particular part of the world? And whether it's tax or cultural dynamics in a particular country, there's differences. So we as a firm need to appreciate and understand that the offering does have to be tailored to different regions. What a family needs in Hong Kong may be quite different than what a family needs in Texas. So our view is the core of the offering is largely the same. Still human beings who have similar problems in many ways would have similar needs, like family education. That's as relevant if you're an American family as if you're a UK family. But there's other aspects of what we do that need to be customized to the market. So that's where we have the 22 offices because we're big believers that in order to be able to provide the service well, you need to be where the clients are. So the advisors who work with the clients, they understand what the clients need, and then they can essentially choose and customize the global offering to make sense for that particular client. There's elements of client service that are consistent across the globe, and then there's other pieces of client service that do vary based upon, not only based upon the particular family, but based upon whether it's tax issues, regulatory issues, family dynamics, cultural dynamics that you have to tailor to a particular market. How do you think about the onboarding of that? So if you're out there and you say, we're going to bring on this team of advisors, when you bring them in-house to talk about your culture, what are the elements of a successful integration from that standpoint? When we're bringing on an individual or a team or certainly a firm, there's various components to multifaceted. Let's say you have the technology side of things. So if you're bringing on a team or a firm, it's very unlikely that they're going to have the identical set of technology applications to us. And even if they did, we do spend quite a bit of time customizing applications to fit our business. So even if we're using the same software vendor as a firm that this team is coming from, we may be using the software a bit differently than this. So really, we spend a lot of time trying to understand like if somebody's looking to join us, we well, understand why are they looking to join us? What do they see us as solving for them or adding to them? Because we want to make sure that we're aligned and we can deliver to them what they're looking to get from us. How do they service their clients? Do they believe? We believe in an open architecture, meaning that we don't manage stocks and bonds ourselves. We spend our time trying to find the best people, the best municipal bond manager or the best U.S. equities manager we can. So we're a believer in an open architecture platform. Big believer in a team-oriented approach to servicing. We're very much the clients should be clients of the firm, not clients of an individual. So trying to really understand what this team or firm is doing. What are their clients expecting from them? What is their service offering? We want to make sure is that if they join us, their clients are getting as good, if not an improved offering from us. The goal would be to have an improved offering for their clients, be able to provide them a deeper and broader service offering. So integration, you have the human piece. Are the employees looking for equity? Are the employees looking for a clear professional growth plan? Part of a growing global business, we may be able to offer more opportunities for a 35-year-old advisor than they may have if they're working for a small firm in the United States. Are we able to provide a consistent or improved technology offering? Can we provide the reporting that their clients are used to and expecting do you understand how they're feeing it on the clients? Is the investment portfolio, are we significantly different in the approach or the philosophy or are we aligned on investments? These are people businesses. So things like compensation and benefits, you spend time making sure mapping, making sure that we understand what they're getting and hopefully we're able to provide something competitive or better than what they've gotten. So there's a lot. You think of an integration, if we look at our firm, we probably have 10 to 15 different business heads that are involved in looking at an integration and making sure that we know we can be successful. So whether it's somebody on the advisor side, the client service side, operations, finance, legal compliance, there's a lot of moving parts to making sure an integration is successful. Yeah. Is that the big attraction where you people are just looking at that operational backbone and saying, look, I can just leverage all the things that Ulti provides and I can go back to actually taking care of my clients? It's not in every case, but in a lot of cases... These businesses that were started 20, 30 years ago, the people that started or persons that started those businesses likely got into it because they really enjoyed working with clients. And then as they've had success and built their businesses, in some cases, some of these people said, well, I'm actually now spending a lot less time doing what I enjoy, which is working with clients and finding new clients, clients spending a lot of time trying to figure out what technology platform we should be using or dealing with the regulatory and compliance 
infrastructure needed to run a business today is vastly different than I think it was 20 years ago. I might be spending a lot of time working out operational issues with our custodians. Some of the principals of these firms can end up spending a lot of time doing things that they don't really enjoy. And it's taking time away from what they do enjoy. And that's also led to their business's growth rate flattening because they were the people that really drove the growth and brought in the clients and spent a lot of time doing that. And they just haven't had the time to do that. That is a key reason in many firms looking to do something strategically. They want to get back to doing what they really enjoy. They don't want to dedicate the time and resources to really building out a large mid and back office and broad service offering. So partnering with us allows them to take advantage of everything that we built. And it allows us to offer them, again, the time to do what they really enjoy doing. That's working with their clients. That's great. So Kevin, this has been really insightful and informative and I want to leave with two questions. And one is, what advice would you give to an emerging manager from an operational perspective? Sometimes you learn, it's like trial by error. I think going into it with the humility that you're not going to get every decision right. You want to make sure that if you get something wrong, it doesn't really hurt you. Evaluating technology platforms to necessarily get a great sense of how the technology platform is going to work for you as a firm, the investment needed to make these systems really work well for a particular business should not be underestimated. Say, just acknowledging the time spent on just for business like this to be successful, folks in client service and operations are enormously important to delivering the offering. An advisor is not going to be successful in a business like this without a terrific mid back office team. So I think going into it, really appreciating the value that those staff members provide to your organization and to your clients is something that I would strongly suggest it's sometimes not fully appreciated. Yeah. And then the other question I have is what industry resource book could be an article, Twitter account that you might refer to people? But to follow Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger, I think, had a suggested book list. And one of the books that was on his list called The Outsiders, which is something that myself and a few of my colleagues here have read. It's really a book that talks about capital allocation and profiles some executives many people may not be familiar with. They're not necessarily household names. Yeah. Is it a Will Thorndike book? Yeah. It's a great book. The book really sheds a lot of light on how important those decisions can be, both things you choose to do and the things you choose not to do. They said, what are we actually really good at doing and what are we not great at doing? One thing we concluded we're not going to be good at doing is building software. Yeah. The Outsiders, I thought was a terrific book. Well, Kevin, thanks for your time today and appreciate all your insight and excited to see what the future holds for Alti. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time.